Explorer Society secret agent Cleo leapt off the edge of a hill, grabbed a rope midair, and swung across a rushing stream. The air whipped at her dark brown hair as she let go of the rope and landed on the opposite bank of the stream, before somersaulting and then jumping to her feet. Cleo followed a trail, running as fast as she could as she checked her watch. She'd have to move faster if she wanted to reach her goal. Thick jungle trees covered the trail above her. She jumped over a log and slid under a tangle of branches. At the end of the trail, the jungle opened into a man-made obstacle course of tunnels and climbing walls, swings and monkey bars. Cleo jumped onto a climbing wall and pulled herself up, hand over hand, to a platform on the top. Then she leapt off and grabbed onto a monkey bar, swinging from bar to bar until she reached the end and fell into a foam pit. After climbing out of the pit, she crawled through a pipe tunnel and hurtled a low wall. The finish line was close. She grabbed another rope and swung across a ditch. When she landed on the other side, she sprinted as fast as she could until reaching the finish line. Cleo hunched over and took a deep breath, checking her watch. 10 minutes, 32 seconds, a new record. She pumped her fist into the air and took a drink from a pouch on her belt. It had been two years since Cleo left her home in Brazil to join the Explorer Society. This obstacle course was always difficult, but she was determined to beat her last time. Cleo was 14, having accomplished a lot for her age, but she was always pushing herself to do better. Cleo was short for Cleopatra, her chosen secret agent name, after the famed Egyptian queen. Her real name was Leah Diaz, but since joining the society, she went by her nickname, Cleo. Cleo's watch buzzed. It was her partner, Lance, short for Lancelot. I'm waiting at the library when you're ready, he said. Yes, that's right, Cleo said. I'll be there in a minute. She wiped her face off with a towel and then found her electric motorbike near the entrance to the obstacle course. Explorer Society headquarters was located on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, surrounded by tall mountains and jungle terrain. On the way to the library, Cleo drove past apartments where secret agents and staff lived and the tall buildings that made up the headquarters offices. On the way, she also passed new recruits jogging in formation. She saluted them, glad she was done with her initial training. A minute later, she arrived at the Explorer Society library, a tall circular building with windows on every floor. She parked her bike, jogged in, and found her partner, Lance, near the back of the first floor. Beside him was Elena Peabody, Explorer Society's head researcher. Her job was to run the library and its archives. Hi, Cleo, Elena said. She wore a red coat with thick black glasses. Cleo noticed Lance's watch was plugged into a computer. Their watches were used to record everything they saw and did during their missions. We're downloading all the data you picked up in 19th century London during your last mission. Great, Cleo said. Remembering their last mission, which took place 200 years ago during the Industrial Revolution. There they tracked down Fiona von Perferoy and helped get back James Watt's new steam engine plans. It had been a dangerous mission, but fortunately they found the plans and learned a lot about the Industrial Revolution. Cleo watched as videos from their visit showed up on computer screens all around them. When the upload was finished, Elena removed a cord from Lance's watch and handed it back to him. Thanks again, she said, and I'll be ready to gather your data when you return from your next mission. Lance gave her a thumbs up, and then he and Cleo left the library. Speaking of next mission, are you ready? Lance asked as they climbed onto Cleo's motorbike. I'm feeling good about it, Cleo said, driving away from the library. I spent yesterday researching ancient Egypt and some of the people and places of the time period. I also beat my own record on the obstacle course. How about you? I did my own research too, Lance said, and then I spent the morning at the gym and dojo. Among Explorer Society agents, Lance was known for his strength and martial arts abilities. He and Cleo had been partners for six months now and so far had made a great team. Both were teenagers because the Explorer Society liked to recruit young people. A minute later, Cleo drove her motorbike into the wide open door of a massive garage. Inside were several all-terrain time-traveling vehicles, similar to Cleo and Lance's, but painted different colors. Cleo and Lance's ATV was dark red with tinted windows and tire treads like tanks instead of wheels. 
Gadget, their mechanic, was on top, fidgeting with one of the satellite dishes. How's our ATV looking? Lance called out. Gadget looked up. Oh, it's doing good. Fortunately, you kept it safe on your last mission. We were nearly run over by a train, Cleo said. Oh, about that, Gadget said. I must have been off with the coordinates. There isn't a train track there in our time. Well, do your research next time, Cleo joked. I'll do better, Gadget said, and slid down a ladder on the side of the large ATV. He was wearing his Explorer Society royal blue jumpsuit with a pair of safety goggles on his head. Are your watches ready, he asked. Lance and Cleo held up their wrists. The silver watches gleamed. Gadget looked them over and nodded. I added a few more features you can check out before you go. Your ancient Egyptian costumes should be ready, too. Colonel Gruff, their section commander, walked into the garage. Well, no time to lose. Are you ready for the briefing? Yes, sir, Cleo and Lance said. Let's do it inside your ATV. We're short on time today, Colonel Gruff said. They all climbed up through the side door of the vehicle. Inside the map room, a 3D holographic globe spun in the center of a large table. Colonel Gruff tapped a few buttons on the side of the table, and a 3D map of ancient Egypt appeared. The map zoomed into the pharaoh's palace. Colonel Gruff spoke. Two days ago, the pharaoh's scepter went missing. As you know, the pharaoh is king of Egypt, one of the most powerful leaders of the ancient world. The scepter is very important to him and an important part of history. We don't know who stole the staff yet, but the pharaoh is going to need it before tomorrow, in his time, of course, which is around 5,000 years ago. You think you're ready? Lance and Cleo nodded. You haven't let me down yet, Gruff said. Find that staff and catch whoever took it. I'm tired of these time thieves causing all this trouble, and I don't know what history would do without the Explorer Society. We'll get it back, Cleo said confidently. Gruff nodded and closed the map. We'll see you back soon, he said and saluted. Good luck. He climbed out the side of the ATV as Lance and Cleo walked to the front of the vehicle and got into their seats. They snapped on their safety buckles, and Lance powered up the engines. Gadget stood in the garage, waving them toward the exit, then gave them a thumbs up as they passed by. Lance drove the ATV to the runway. Out the windows they saw the tall, lush mountains of the island headquarters. The sky was clear. It would be a great day to time travel. When the ATV was lined up with the runway, Lance checked a few numbers on the navigation computer, then looked at Cleo. She gave him a thumbs up, and he looked back again, then shoved a gear forward. The ATV raced across the runway, and soon was speeding over 100 miles an hour. When the time was right, Lance flipped another switch, and a time warp opened on the runway. Then the ATV disappeared. For a moment, all was black. Cleo had done this many times before, but it always made her anxious. A rainbow of colors swirled around them, and another hole opened, and the ATV was racing headlong down a brick road. Or was it a road? Cleo looked around and saw that they were headed downward. Not down a road, but down the side of a pyramid. Ah, Lance cried out. They were driving down the side of a gigantic Egyptian pyramid. The ride was bumpy and fast, and if they didn't act quick, they would crash into the bottom of the pyramid. Below, the brown sands of Egypt rushed up to meet them. Lance pulled on the wheel and flipped another switch. The ATV's rockets boosted them off the side of the pyramid and into the sky. Suddenly, they smashed into the top of a palm tree, dropped, and then crashed into a wagon. Next, they were on a road, swerving back and forth as Lance tried to regain control. Sand sprayed left and right. Lance dodged around another palm tree and a small mud hut. Just ahead, they saw a large river. Lance slammed his foot on the brakes and the ATV swerved and slid several feet, stopping at the bank of the river. Whoa, Cleo said, as she and Lance turned to look at each other. How did Gadget get the coordinates wrong again? Lance shrugged. Cleo looked around, trying to make sense of where they had landed. They looked back at the pyramid. This was definitely 2500 BC Egypt. Wow, this is the Nile River, Cleo said. She remembered the Nile River was the longest river in the world, and the reason Egypt existed here at all. For thousands of years, farmers used the Nile to water their crops and to survive. Lance and Cleo climbed out of the front seats and walked through the map room into the dressing room. There they changed into their costumes the research team assembled back at headquarters. 
Cleo's costume was a long white dress with shoulder straps, some basic jewelry, and sandals. Lance's costume was a wraparound brown skirt, necklace, and leather sandals. Nice skirt, Cleo kidded after they changed. Very funny, Lance said. They climbed out the side door of the ATV and slid down the ladder. Fortunately, no one was around to see them yet. Cleo walked up to the Nile and stared across it. Thick reeds and tall palm and date trees surrounded its banks. Lance looked around for a safe place to hide the ATV. We're going to have to take it down, he said. Cleo stepped back as Lance used his watch to remotely drive the ATV straight into the Nile River. As it began to sink, the tank tread wheels slid into the body of the vehicle and a propeller appeared on the back, transforming the ATV into a submarine-like vehicle. Cleo was already checking out a map on her watch. The Pharaoh's palace is that way, she pointed west. They hiked along the bank of the Nile for a short while, making sure to video as much of the river and the land around it as they could. Further down the river, they found Egyptians bathing and using pots to scoop water out of the river. Next, they found a road and passed through a small town, where Egyptian farmers and their children worked in the fields. They looked up and waved, and Lance and Cleo waved back. The Egyptians have been working these fields for hundreds of years, Cleo said. They're watered when the Nile floods, right? Lance said. Yes, you did your homework, Cleo said. During the flooding season, called Aket, the Nile River overflows and floods the farmland. Then the water goes back into the Nile and leaves behind a rich, black soil. Next, the farmers plant their crops and wait until they are ready to harvest. This must be harvest season, Lance said. It looks like they're harvesting wheat. Yes, Cleo said. Wheat, barley, vegetables, melons, figs are some of the crops grown along the Nile. Soon they passed a neighborhood of square, mud-brick houses. Lance pointed at one. I read that they make these by mixing mud and straw. Once it dries and hardens, they use it for bricks. Children played games in the street. One house had a pen with pigs and ducks. A little girl walked by pulling a goat. At the edge of the town, Lance and Cleo heard some commotion and turned to see a company of horses stirring up a cloud of dust. The riders wore fine white dresses, gold jewelry, and ornate headdresses. A few were Egyptian warriors, dressed in armor and carrying spears and bows. Lance and Cleo moved out of the road and watched in amazement as the procession passed. The horses were also decorated in fine saddles and headdresses. At the end of the line, one of them stood tall in a chariot, being pulled by a horse. Cleo recognized the chariots as small, two-wheeled, like wagons used for transportation. To their surprise, when the man saw them, he gave them a funny look and pulled the reins on his horse. He called for the others to stop. Uh-oh, Lance whispered and flipped a switch on his watch, designed to translate Egyptian to English and the other way around. Something is out of place with you two, the tall man said. His skin was dark and he was muscular with dark brown eyes. We need to speak to the pharaoh, Lance said. He remembered pharaoh was another word for the king of Egypt. The warrior laughed. Why should I take you to the pharaoh? We're here to help him find his stolen scepter, Cleo said. The warrior gave them a hard stare and looked both ways. Shh. No one but the pharaoh's most trusted advisors know about this. How do you know? We've been sent to help find it, Cleo said. My name is Menes, the warrior said. I'm one of the pharaoh's top generals. Climb into my chariot and we'll take you to him. Lance and Cleo climbed into the chariot beside the warrior. He snapped the reins and they held on tight as it hurried along the road with the rest of the warriors. Are you recording all this? Lance whispered. Cleo nodded. They passed more small towns of mud brick houses, more fields of wheat and barley and straw. They saw the straw being mixed with mud in large tubs and irrigation ditches channeling the water from the Nile into the vast green fields. Farmers used scythes, large hooked blades, to cut the straw and bundle it. There were also rows of date trees where the fruits were being harvested. As Lance and Cleo passed by, the general grabbed a dried date and let them eat one. They were sweet and very delicious. After the farming towns, they entered the main city of Egypt. Here the roads were stone and the homes were taller and built of stronger materials. 
These Egyptians dressed in finer clothing and wore more jewelry. Ahead, Cleo and Lance saw a gigantic walled fortress. The walls were decorated with colorful artwork, which they recognized as hieroglyphics. The Egyptians didn't have an alphabet like we do, Cleo whispered. They used pictures instead of letters. It was one of the world's oldest written languages. Lance remembered this and recognized some of the hieroglyphics he had memorized while studying for the mission. They passed through the massive entryway of the fortress and inside saw tall white towers that made up the pharaoh's grand palace. Strong warriors stood guard and maids dressed in fine white dresses hurried about preparing for the guests. Lance and Cleo saw many black carved statues of Egypt's different gods, worshipped by the people. At the feet of the statues were flowers and foods and burning incense. The Egyptians believed if they made offerings to their gods, the gods would help them. The procession stopped near the entrance to the palace. There, servants rushed up to take the horses away to their stables. Lance and Cleo climbed out of the chariot and followed the general further into the palace. They looked around amazed at the ornate rugs spread across the ground and the statues and other treasures that adorned the inside of the palace. In the throne room sat Pharaoh Khafra, talking to two of his advisors. He wore a white cloth around his waist, leather sandals with blue jewels, and a gold mantle around his neck. His eyes were dark with black makeup, and his hair was pulled back into a knot. The rest of the room was busy with servants tending to his needs, while fierce-looking guards eyed them carefully. Pharaoh Khafra looked up as Lance and Cleo approached the throne and kneeled. Who are they, Khafra said, pointing at Lance and Cleo. They've come to help find something that's missing, the general said. Khafra's eyebrows raised. Oh, really? He looked them over. Everyone out, he shouted, his voice echoing through the large room. Now, he shouted again. Within seconds, all of the servants and even the guards had left the room. The pharaoh stepped off his throne and eyed Lance and Cleo curiously. He was tall and muscular. He spoke slowly as he circled them. How do you think you will be able to find what's gone missing? It's what we're best at, your majesty, Cleo said. Trust us and we will help you. Khafra stopped and turned away. Follow me and we will see what help you might be. They followed the pharaoh out of the throne room and down a flight of stairs to a lower floor in the palace. The room was dark except for a few torches. Servants worked over a body on a table. As the entire kingdom knows, my father, the great pharaoh, Khufu, is now dead, Khafra said. Here they are preparing his body to be mummified. Have you ever seen a mummy? No, Cleo said, but remember this wasn't entirely true as she had seen one in a museum. Khafra pointed at his father's body. When our kings die, we prepare them for the afterlife by preserving their bodies. We wrap them in cloth and apply wine and spices so they can be reborn in the next life. After my father's body is mummified, we move him to the center of the Great Pyramid so he can rise up and join his ancestors. He was a great king, and I must rule in his place now. Lance and Cleo followed Khafra through the room and up many stairs until they reached a balcony overlooking the land of Egypt. In the distance, they saw brown mountains and sandy dunes. The land was very dry, except for along the river where trees and crops grew in abundance. They also saw the incredibly large pyramids, some of which were still being built by the Egyptian people. Cleo was amazed as crowds of workers used ropes to pull the limestone blocks up the sides of the pyramid. It looked like very difficult work. As Pharaoh, I will be in charge of ruling my people, Defending them and helping build these pyramids, Khafra said. The pyramid you see being built is where I will lie when I join my father in the afterlife. But without the holy scepter, I cannot become the new pharaoh. Khafra looked very angry. Who would have stolen it and why? Don't they know the gods will be angry? Do you have any clues, Cleo asked. Khafra turned to face them. All I know is what servants were in my room the day the scepter went missing. If I don't find it by the time of my father's funeral, if I don't find it by the time of my father's funeral, I will send all of the servants to work on the pyramids for the rest of their lives. Lance and Cleo looked out at the people working on the pyramids and thought what a horrible life that might be. A door to the balcony opened, and a man in a white robe and gold headband greeted the pharaoh. This is Imhotep, 
Coffer said. He is one of my most trusted advisors and chief engineer of the pyramid you see being built. Imhotep, Cleo said. I've heard so much about you. Imhotep smiled. I have served the pharaohs for many years. As a poet, a judge, an engineer, an astronomer, and even a physician. Cleo whispered in Lance's ear. He's basically an Egyptian, Leonardo da Vinci. Lance nodded. Wow, he whispered. They say they can help me find the scepter, the pharaoh said. I'm very suspicious of them, but we need all the help we can get before the funeral. I will show them around and see if they can help, Imhotep said. After Khafra left, Imhotep showed Lance and Cleo down a flight of stairs to an open courtyard within the palace walls. In the middle was a clear blue pool with lily pads, bright pink flowers, and a few birds resting nearby. The courtyard was empty except for them. I have some clues about the missing scepter, Imhotep said quietly as they walked around the pool, but I was afraid to let the pharaoh know. Anyone who says they know anything about the scepter has become a suspect. But the same day the scepter was stolen, I noticed a strange man lurking around the palace, pretending to be a visitor from a nearby country. He wore a dark red robe and used it to cover most of his head. He was asking everyone about the pharaoh's treasures, and someone even saw him poking around the pharaoh's bedroom. I don't know how he got around the guards, but ever since the scepter went missing, he has gone missing too. Interesting, Cleo said. At least now we know who to look for. I thought I'd go to the market and see if he shows up again if you'd like to accompany me, Imhotep said. Definitely, Lance said. First let me show you through my workspace and then to the stable where we will find our mount. Cleo and Lance followed Imhotep off the balcony and down a flight of stairs to a large room at the bottom of the palace. Workbenches, maps, drawings, and tools of different shapes and sizes filled the room. They noticed papyrus, the paper made out of the reeds of the Nile, on which the Egyptians wrote. Egyptians were some of the first people to keep records and use their written language, hieroglyphics, to do so. Lance and Cleo saw a small version of the pyramid. In another corner of the room were mixing bowls filled with liquids and herbs. They also saw a drawing of stars. You stay busy, don't you, Cleo said. Imhotep laughed. Ever since I was a little boy, I was very curious. I loved looking at the stars and wondering why the gods placed them in those magnificent patterns. He pointed at the table of mixing bowls. I also like to create different remedies to try and help the sick. My biggest project right now is designing the pyramid. It's a huge undertaking. It's a huge undertaking, but I love to learn and experiment and try new things. I think the gods gave us the ability to think so we could be curious and discover new things on our own. Cleo remembered the many achievements in the history books attributed to Imhotep. Little did he know, someday, they would consider Imhotep a god for his wisdom and contributions to Egyptian society. They followed Imhotep out of his workshop and to the stable, which smelled horrible. He showed them to a camel where a stable worker helped them onto its humped back. This is Shishi. He will take good care of you, Imhotep said with a laugh, then climbed onto his own camel. They left the stable and followed a road to a busy marketplace where small shops sold fruits, vegetables, bread, jewelry, tools, clothing, pots, and many other items of different shapes, sizes, and colors. Egypt was one of the first trade centers of the world, and people brought goods along the Nile from distant lands. Any ideas who the thief might be? Cleo asked Lance. I have a couple ideas, Lance said. He'd studied the dossiers of criminals before the mission and was watching the crowds for anyone familiar. When they turned a corner into the open area of the market, Imhotep pulled his camel to a stop and surveyed the people hurrying to and fro. His eyes suddenly narrowed. There, he said, pointing across the marketplace. Sure enough, they saw someone on horseback wearing a dark red robe. His head was covered. It's very unusual for someone to cover their head this time of year, Imhotep said. Surrounding the men were five tough-looking Egyptians, all armed with clubs. Imhotep whistled and his camel trotted forward. They followed the robed man and his guard through the marketplace and onto the open road that led outside the city. Before long, they ended up near the base of the Great Pyramids of Giza, where Khafra's father, Khufu, would be laid to rest. The Great Pyramid of Giza would later become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Imhotep motioned them to hold back and climbed off his camel. 
They watched as the robe man and his guards walked a good distance around the pyramid and then disappeared inside. Lance, Cleo, and Imhotep ducked down and then followed, trying to stay out of view. After rounding the pyramid, they saw the man walking into its open door. How can he do this? Imhotep whispered to the others. Surely the gods will strike him down. Wait here, Lance said. We'll follow him. I don't advise it, Imhotep said, sounding scared. Cleo and Lance waited until the man and his guards disappeared inside the pyramid, then followed behind. The tunnel leading into the center of the pyramid was dark and cold. The stone was still freshly chiseled, and dust filled the air from the footsteps ahead of them. Soon it was pitch black, and they could only see the torches of the road man and his guards. I'm watching out for booby traps, Lance said. Cleo laughed. Not in this pyramid. Well, I'm sure they existed. That's mostly in movies. Once the pharaoh's mummified body is put here, they will seal the entrance with a very big stone. That will keep him safe for a long time. The tunnel led to a large open room where they saw shadows dancing across the stone walls cast by the torches. The room was filled with piles of treasure and gold, food, furniture, and even a chariot. These were the items people believed the dead pharaoh would need on his journey through the underworld. The robed man and his guards were hurrying about, collecting some of the items and loading them into a wooden box. Lance and Cleo ducked behind the chariot and watched as the robed man turned to their direction. Instantly, they recognized him, Sir Arthur Crankshaw III. Crankshaw was a famed, modern-day archaeologist known for breaking all the rules when it came to his specialty. Archaeologists are supposed to be careful when they find new artifacts and share what they've found with others, but Crankshaw was reckless while discovering new artifacts, causing much destruction in his path. He was also selfish, keeping all the artifacts in his private collection, deep in the basement of his mansion in London. Crankshaw dressed like a 19th century archaeologist with a tan-colored pith helmet and tan button-up clothes. He also had the largest white curled mustache you'd ever seen. At last, all Pharaoh Khufu's treasures for the taking, Crankshaw exclaimed. How marvelous these will be in my own collection! I wonder what time-traveling vehicle he found to get here, Cleo wondered. They were aware of other organizations that had access to time-traveling vehicles for a fee, and criminals like Fiona von Perferoy and Sir Arthur Crankshaw had money to pay for them. They watched as Crankshaw move quickly around the room, loading artifacts into his box, but by now they had enough. On the count of three, Lance and Cleo pulled two stun devices from their packs and lunged from behind the chariot. The first guard swung his club at Lance, who dodged it and zapped him in the chest with the stun device. Another thug ran at Cleo, but she knocked him down with a roundhouse kick to the shoulder. Crankshaw looked up in alarm. Explorer Society agents, no doubt, he exclaimed, throwing a gold-beaded necklace into his box. A guard dove at Lance, but Lance jumped out of the way, sending him crashing into the chariot. Cleo hurtled another guard as he swung his club at her. She wrapped her legs around his neck, flipped forward, and twisted him to the floor. Crankshaw, seeing that he was no match for the agents, grabbed his box of treasures and raced for the door with two of the remaining guards in tow. Lance dodged a punch from another guard, grabbed his arm, and flipped him onto his back. Cleo finished off the last Egyptian guard with a jump kick, then turned around and raced after Crankshaw down the dark tunnel. By the time they reached the exit, Crankshaw and his guards were climbing onto their horses and galloping away. Where is Imhotep? Cleo exclaimed. Suddenly Imhotep came flying around the corner in a chariot pulled by two horses. I thought this would be faster than the camels, he said with a smile. Lance and Cleo climbed on and held on tight as Imhotep whipped the horses into action. From the chariot, Cleo saw a large leather bag tied to the back of Crankshaw's saddle. That's got to be the scepter, she exclaimed. Imhotep whipped the horses harder as Crankshaw and his guards rounded the other side of the pyramid and raced towards a large structure under construction. It had the head of a man and the body of a lion. Workers pulled ropes, lifting a stone up the sides. Artists stood on ladders using chisels to shape its face. It's the Sphinx, Lance said. The large sculpture was one of the most recognizable monuments in world history. Both agents couldn't believe they were seeing it in person. They watched as Crankshaw's horse galloped toward the Sphinx and recklessly crashed into one of the ladders, 
causing the artist to fall to the sand below. Imhotep dodged the wreckage with the chariot as they grew closer and closer. Crankshaw raced down a sandy dune and circled around a row of palm trees. Imhotep cut through the trees right now on Crankshaw's tail. One of the guards swerved his horse to the side and swung his club at Lance. Lance dodged the club and grabbed the guard's arm, yanking him off the horse. The guard toppled to the ground and rolled behind them in a cloud of dust. Another guard moved in for an attack, but Cleo had already zapped him with her stun device. Now it was just the agents and Crankshaw. You'll never get the scepter, Crankshaw shouted, shaking his fists at them. I'll take it back to our time and keep it locked in my collection forever. The scepter isn't yours, Cleo shouted back. You're not getting away. Crankshaw rode his horse around a road and into a work area, where dozens of Egyptian workers chiseled limestone from the side of a mountain. It's the quarry, Imhotep said. These are the limestone blocks for building the pyramids. They watched as Crankshaw's horse leapt over a stone block and knocked down a row of workers. Imhotep dodged around rows of blocks and followed Crankshaw to another work area, where workers mixed stacks of straw with mud. But not looking ahead, Crankshaw raced his horse straight into a huge pit of mud and straw. The horse whinnied. Crankshaw cried out as the horse sunk up to its knees. Imhotep pulled on the chariot's reins and skidded to a halt at the edge of the mud pit. The agents hopped out of the chariot and hurried to the edge of the pit. Now look what you've done, Lance said with a smirk. The scepter, Crankshaw cried. He grabbed the leather bag and pulled it off the back of the horse. As he did so, Lance reached out and snatched it from him. Crankshaw was still stuck in the mud, but Cleo tossed him a rope and pulled him out along with the horses. Before he could make a run for it, Cleo used the same rope to tie his arms and hands. Lance walked over to Cleo and peeked inside the leather bag. Sure enough, it was the pharaoh's scepter gleaming gold and covered in precious jewels. They gave each other a high five, and showed the scepter to Imhotep, who clapped in excitement. Now Khufu will let all of his servants, who he thought stole the scepter, go free. Suddenly another chariot and cavalcade of soldiers rode up to the scene. Standing tall in the chariot was Menes, the pharaoh's general who they had met earlier that day. What's going on here? he asked sternly. We must get to the pharaoh, Imhotep said. He's preparing for his father's funeral, Menes said. And we have just the final piece he needs, said Cleo. Back at the Nile River, Lance and Cleo watched as their time-traveling van rose out of the murky waters of the Nile and drove up onto the bank. Sir Arthur Crankshaw was sitting on the ground next to them, still tied up with ropes and grumbling. Do you know what it costs me to travel back in time to get that scepter and the pharaoh's other treasures? Yes, Cleo said. A very long time in jail. Lance laughed. We're hoping you can tell us who's providing these services. Time travel can be dangerous, especially in the hands of criminals like you. Crankshaw growled. Lance stood him up and led him to a compartment in the ATV where he would be locked away until they returned to headquarters. Then the agents changed out of their Egyptian costumes and climbed into the front seat of the van. Lance dialed in the future date and drove the ATV further along the river. You don't want to stay and watch the funeral? Cleo asked. Oh, I want to see it, Lance said, as the ATV's engines ignited and it lifted off the bank of the river. I just thought the view would be much better from up here. The ATV soared high up into the sky. Below, they watched a colorful parade of horses, chariots, and royalty, following Pharaoh Khufu's bright gold coffin toward the Great Pyramid of Giza. Egyptians crowded along the roads to watch their king pass by. The new pharaoh Khafre followed behind in a beautiful chariot, holding the scepter Lance and Cleo had taken back from Crankshaw. Is the camera rolling? Cleo asked. Lance nodded. The research team is going to love this. Once Khufu's sarcophagus was safely inside the pyramid, workers pulled a huge limestone block forward and sealed the entrance. Goodbye, Egypt. It was fun, Lance said, shifting a gear. Suddenly, the ATV rocketed forward, and in a blast of red and blue light, it disappeared.